start. Um, they um, they will then mate for three three days to a week. Generally, that's the length length of time that leopards mate for. Um, now, the, the 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 actual mating itself is very similar. The the ex like I said, oh, it's kind of similar, but okay. So with lions, the lioness, if she gets up or moves around, the male will come up behind her and try and mate with her. With leopards, they'll often lie down, and um, the female will get up and come, and she walks in front of the male, and she growls, and she'll present herself in front of the male, and the male will then mate with her. But it is quite an aggressive affair. The the obviously the males, it does hurt the females a little bit. Um, now we've g gone into it and we've spoken about it before with the cats, the big cats, especially having a slightly barbed penis um, and that, that does hurt the females but it is, um, the theory is that it, um, it it basically initiates the um, the ovulating process and helps with the mating so the, hopefully that the, the mating well, that mating session will then be successful but um, when the male does jump off the female he does hurt her a little bit so she'll often turn and she turns and she'll swap and the male jumps off it's quite a quite a wonderful um, a wonderful show to watch it is interesting very interesting and a wonderful display but and can get quite aggressive so in terms of that lions two lions it's not as aggressive I, I feel or um, well, from what I've seen it's not as aggressive but it's very similar very similar Chastity, you asked if uh, male leopards uh, take over new territory. Um, will they hunt down the cubs or cubs in the area that do not belong to them? Uh, it's not necessarily an, uh, actively hunting them down. However, if they bump into cubs that do not belong to them, then um, the chances are, depending on how old the cubs are, if they um, sub adults already, chances are they won't uh, they won't pick up any issues. If it's a young male, you probably displaying a little bit before um, so they, they're quite noisy birds there we go so hopefully you saw the white wing bars just crossing the, um, as the bird just flew across the screen there with the long tail trailing behind so the greenwood hoopoos are uh, a family orientated bird and right at the tip of their bill it's really sensitive 
So where we saw them was actually the, the dead tree just in front of that little bush. And they'll actually probe the dead tree for any insects that are buried just beneath the surface because that bill that bill tip's very sensitive. There's a lot of uh, what we call mechanical receptor cells. So they just feel uh, any, any, any um, change uh, from the tapping from the insects and things like that. So they can actually just pick up the slightest movement and they can then sense it and obviously bury their long bill. Hopefully you saw it, it was actually quite, quite a long bill like that. So about that sort of length on uh, quite a small bird really. So that helps them to find those insects. So while I've still got you, um, I've got a couple of things for you. So we've got a who dung it as promised. So there you go. So this is the first one of the morning. So what animal produced that? Uh, if you'd like to get involved, hashtag Safari Live, what animal do you think produced that? And again, I am being a little bit mean because obviously I'm not showing you where we got it from. But if I break it open for you, now if you have been on board the last couple of days, then we have had a look at some of the larger animals. So hopefully you're, you're seeing the size relative to <coughs> my fingers there. But hopefully you can see the material inside is very fine. You know, we're not seeing any big pieces of uh, matter. <laughs> I was almost going to give the game away there. But uh, yeah, the, that seems to be the biggest piece there. So yeah. So have a think. And if you know, so hashtag Safari Live, what animal has actually dropped that and while you're thinking about that I've also picked up this and the reason why I'm spending a bit of time as Byron says we're just stopping and listening to see if there's any sound of those leopards but I think we're going to be heading off down towards central to see if they haven't gone that way instead but while we're here this is from the weeping wattle um, I, I would normally have taken three but I don't want to take all the leaves from the tree unnecessarily now this can be used as toilet paper, but I think this is the one ply. I'll keep my look out for uh, the four ply bush, uh, but as I say, if you're really caught short, this is the one to go for, but you have to be careful that you don't go for the common hookthorn, which can look very similar, but on the back it has rows of hooks all the way up that do that, all the way up, just along the back of the leaf there. And believe me, you do not <laughs> want to be uh, using that. Mm. You can imagine why. So this is also quite an interesting tree uh, for a couple of different cultures uh, in, in South Africa. And some of you might remember Patrick. He used to guide uh, for Wild Earth a uh, while, while, while back now. Um, and I was actually telling this story because uh, I used to guide in the Waterberg where the Sepedi people are and this tree is very important for them to produce a, a good look, travel look charm and they would get three leaves then they would tie them together like this and then they would take that in the pocket or on their vehicle so that would actually keep them safe while they're traveling now, when I was saying this story, Patrick said, oh, that's really interesting, because Patrick's Shangan. So Shangan are, are kind of found uh, more in this area. And he said, we use the same tree, but we actually use a small branch instead, which I found really interesting. So the same tree, but slightly different part of it to keep, keep them safe. So yeah, the weeping wattle. Cool. So let's continue on, not hearing anything else no alarm calls or anything like that and apparently we do have some answers to the who done it izzy with bushbuck getting there unfortunately izzy there wasn't any leaves involved there so you would still see some fragment of leaf so but in the right area is a herbivore so well done Izzy and great guess there. A little bit too big for a bush book as well. Kudu. Oh. 
that build Hornbill? Oh, he was just chilling on the bush there. There he goes. So, red billed hornbill was a little bit elusive for us yesterday. Also looking for ants possibly on the ground. So red billed hornbill. So Anna Marie and I missed who else was saying kudu. Oh, oh, here comes the sun. Here comes the sun. Do, 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 do. Yeah, sorry, I won't crack your TV screen. Oh, it's always so much better with the sun in the world, isn't it? Look at that. Oh. I don't know if you heard, there was a snorting going on just to the right. But unfortunately, <laughs> It, f it lures you into a false sense of security when you think, oh yes, a lion call, there could be a leopard. Unfortunately, with the, with the impala this time of year, they're gearing up for that small, quick rut uh, coming up. And unfortunately, that was the uh, call for the territorial ram <laughs> from the impala doing that. <laughs> I can actually see him just peeking through the bush right off in the distance there. So when when uh, the impala are given a long call, they can uh, sound, uh, they can give that first part, that snorting. <laughs> but then you get quite a lot of them uh, snorting through their nose to say, yes, I've seen, seen what you're seeing. So... Uh, I'll keep, keep an ear out though, but that's why you listen you, uh, for any help to locate the predators as well. Obviously you read the bush newspaper, uh, so now that the sun's starting to rise it's going to be a little bit easier to see what's been left behind. And you use your sense of smell as well, so leopards actually smell like popcorn, um, believe it or not. Uh, Jennets do as well, but leopard especially, so if we can smell popcorn in the bush then we know that the leopard is fairly close by. So yes, unfortunately it's not kudu, um, it's, it's about the right size, but kudu don't tend to clump together like this. So this is very characteristic of this particular animal clumping together. So hopefully we'll have a few more guesses. Chapman Sparkle, Waterbuck. Could be that it's not quite this time. So Waterbuck, it can clump as well. Warthog. Now warthog are quite interesting as they actually are a much much larger than what you'd probably give warthog credit for. It looks very similar to that of a horse believe it or not just a smaller version of horse dung. So kind of a kidney shaped looking about this sort of size for warthog. But at least you're all going for the herbivores, which is good. C. Smith and Liz say zebra. Uh, again, zebra, if you can think of what a domestic horse looks like, that's what the zebra look like. So that, again, that sort of size, the kidney shaped. Angie says a giraffe. Um, unfortunately not Angie. Again, the right sort of size to the pellet, but the giraffe, because it drops like two meters, it tends to get spread out all over the show. So you don't tend to get the clumping unless they've got a bit of a problem. Occasionally you might get clumping, but then as I say, they might have an upset stomach.
<laughs> getting everything but white lady Aylan saying Niala again slightly smaller for the Niala hello lady ginger saying Steenbok a little bit too big for Steenbok Debbie, also a little bit big for Impala. So I think there's only one animal left. The herbivores that could be found here. <laughs> now, have you ever noticed how well groomed Impala look? Now, Impala actually have the ability or that the, their front teeth, their incisors are slightly loose in the bottom of their jaw it spreads apart so it acts like a comb so when they they groom each other or themselves they actually are able to comb their fur and that's why they always look so neat and pristine because they can just get rid of that fur that might be a little bit dead or coming out I, wonder, I was going to say I wonder where the rest of the herd is but there's a male just behind and he's actually marking a bush. Ah, who was that? Roshi and Ruth, well done. You get complete bragging rights this morning. It is in fact a wildebeest. So the wildebeest do tend to clump together, especially this time of year. Um, because there's actually not as much moisture to clump the dung together. They're going to need a lot of that moisture and they're going to be using that. So to still find clumped dung this time of year, then generally speaking, it is going to be wildebeest. Because as I say, there's not a lot of moisture around. It's very characteristic of the wildebeest. And as I say, very fine matter inside, very fine pieces of grass so wildebeest are grazers they eat the grass so we're not seeing any fragments of leaves in there at all and it is so small if you're thinking yeah but a wildebeest you know if you think about the same size I'm just trying to think what would be the same size that you can relate it to but wildebeest um, so we just saw the impala there so let me see if I can actually give you a size comparison so for the impala uh, impala would come up to, pull that down, <laughs> so the impala would come up headwise to about here, wildebeest probably about here, so the back something like that, whereas the impala about that sort of height, something like that. So just try and give you a bit of a size comparison, um, so let's say wildebeest back, maybe a small pony, would that, that would be about right, something like that. Um, so yeah, so the fact that the dung is so small, it's because they have a th four chambered stomach so they can get as much goodness out of what they eat as possible. So they're really effective at taking all that goodness out of their food. Whereas things like rhinos and elephants, which are called hindgut fermenters, they're really not good at doing that at all. So they actually waste a lot of what they eat. And that means that they produce huge dung. So the four-chambered stomach animals produce very small dung to their body size because they are so efficient. And that really helps them. Uh, so they don't have to take in as much food. So whatever they take in, they can just get every, or they can use as much of it as possible. Whereas with the rhinos and the elephants and the other hindgut fermenters, they have to eat lots of food. But the plus side for them is they don't have to have high quality whereas the four-chambered stomach animals have to have good quality food. So it's this trade-off all the time, and that means all those animals that you see, the antelope, they don't actually have to compete for the same food. So they go for either different parts of the plant, different types of plant, so that they can all actually be here and they're not competing. So if you ever actually wondered, you know, why do the animals not fight over the food, it's because of that. So let's carry on, we're gonna head along central and see 
if these leopards have actually moved further afield or if we can catch up with anything else that might be towards Buffelsuk Dam. Oh, Byron's luck is, is uh, wearing out on the cats as well, unfortunately. <laughs> but who knows, he may still be able to bump into them. Fingers crossed for you guys. But uh, let's see what Byron's got for you. Let's see you in a bit. <laughs> well, I hope so, Tora. I hope my luck returns because we haven't had any luck. I thought I saw tracks of a male leopard on the basically on the northern boundary um but you know it does diff not not very fresh but i'm still driving around trying to listen and look out for any sign of these leopards i'm not going to give up just yet the temperatures actually dropped a little bit from earlier this morning the clouds have disappeared it's opened up quite nicely and that's also probably why it's a bit colder now <coughs> But we'll, we'll see. We're still going to drive around and look very carefully. <coughs> oh, Ricard, you asked, what is the oldest cat on the reserve? Uh, oh, I don't know now. Um, I, I, I wonder. Um, maybe some of you can let us know. I think... The, the oldest one that, that I know of, um, I think, is Mvula. I think Mvula is about 12 years old. Uh, that's a male leopard, a male leopard, 12-year-old male leopard. Uh, out of the, the lions and leopards in the area that I know, that, that is the oldest one I know. But I don't know about some of the other leopards in the area. Uh, maybe some of you back home can let me know. Uh, it's just a vehicle that's about to pass with guests. Let me see if I... Oh, how am I going to find a little gap here? Hold on a second. Let me just drive past and greet everybody. Morning, morning. How's it going? Good, good, thanks. No, not yet. We'll let you know. Good luck. Bye-bye. Thank you. So... Um, just seeing some other, other guests on the vehicle out there all bundled up. It is quite chilly this morning. Um, I'm trying to think what other... The oldest, um, some of the oldest cats I've seen, uh, there was a female leopard on Londolozi. I'm, try, uh, I'm trying to think now. Uh, what, uh, what was her name? Um, uh, sure, I've been a blank. See what happens. You get some of these names, and it'll come to me now. Um, there was a very well known leopard known as 3 4 um, because of a spot pattern. She had a 3 4 spot pattern, and it was just a very well known leopard. She, she lived to about 17 years old. Uh, which is really old for a, for a leopard. That's a good age. But there was another leopard that lived up to I think it was 18 um, 18 years old. What was her name? Wow, someone said uh, there was a there's a leopard a Safari a safari leopard. I'm not sure where was she um, Apparently she lived up uh, up until 19. That's amazing. That's incredible. No, I don't know where that leopard... Oh, so it's Karula's mother. Apparently she lived up until the age of 19. That's, uh, that's very impressive. Wow, that's amazing. That's very old for a leopard. You know, the oldest leopard I ever saw was, uh, I think, 18 years old. Um, but what was her name? Oh, I can't remember now. It'll come to me. It'll come to me. I'll think carefully. Uh, Michael, you say the oldest male leopard in the area is Mvula, and then the oldest females would be Tandi 
And um, and so you was the other one, Chantal, turn the end. Uh, sorry, I didn't hear that. Um, but yeah, so Tandy, and Tandy, what, how old is Tandy now? She, isn't she about seven or eight, I think I heard someone say, I'm not sure. Eleven, sorry, Tandy's eleven, yeah, so that's a, a good age. So there's Mvula, still the oldest, I think, twelve years old. I wonder, I'm st stopping to listen again. I wonder these leopards. It's funny, I mean, they, they were quite far west yesterday morning. Um, and then during the afternoon, they obviously just turned and came back. Came through this way, hiding through the drainage lines. And then headed down to the dam late last night, 11 or 12 o'clock, which was in that direction. Um, and then it looks like, I mean, it, by the sounds of things, they came back this way. You never know; they could still be in one of these one of these drainages close by. Well, don't forget, everyone, questions and comments. Please send it to us. Hashtag Safari Live via Twitter is how you do it. We love hearing from all our viewers. It's actually a beautiful morning. Look at these clouds coming over again. Mike, yes, the the general rule is that uh, female cat species, or the female of the cat species, they do live longer than the males. So with lions, now these are average ages. With lions, um, average age for a female is about, call it 15 years old. And then, um, and then with um, with leopards, average age is about 15 to 17. So lions, it's about 14 to 15. And and um, and then uh, the um, sorry, leopards, but yeah, but lions. All right. Well, we're going to continue our search. Let's head across to Tara and see what she's managed to find now. <laughs> a beautiful male kudu. And that sun is just spotlighting his magnificence. How majestic is he? Absolutely stunning. And once again, amazing how well they camouflage in the bush. Can barely make him out. Legs looking like the bushes. Definitely white lady, absolutely gorgeous kudu. Yeah, legs looking like the trunks of the bushes surrounding him. The horns, the branches. And you can see absolutely motionless and rain ranco he does look so tall he is actually quite a large antelope the back is about the same height as a wildebeest but certainly the head is held much higher 
Now he's going into a drainage line, but he's very wary. There's a few birds calling just to my left, and I think he's just checking to make sure that it's not alarm calls or anything. It's not sounding like an alarm call to me. But obviously he is by himself, so he has to make even more certain that there's nothing going to come out and grab him before he actually takes a meal. As if he judges it wrong and there is something there and he's distracted by eating, that could be the split second delay that could cost him his life. There he goes. Hi Charlie, good morning to you. How heavy are the hoodoo? I used to know, <laughs> but I'm struggling to remember now. Maybe someone can actually check up for us how heavy those horns can actually get. It's one of those, it's Unfortunately, I don't hold on to numbers very easily. So if someone could check up for us, that'll be absolutely fantastic because I can't quite remember. So hashtag Safari Live if you can come back with an answer for us. And there's a Leadwood. I was just talking about Leadwoods earlier and uh, the, <coughs> uh, the, the fact that they can actually produce toothpaste. What does worry me though is, like I was saying earlier, you can use the ash as a toothpaste. You can also use the ash for a whitewash as well. So it does worry me that you can use it like a paint. But as I say, if you uh, are really desperate in the bush, then uh, that's what you need to use. Now, the, the lead wood as well is a very hard wood. It's a very dense wood. And it is actually protected now, I believe. So you're not actually supposed to use lead wood for firewood anymore. But he is known as the old man of the bush. And unfortunately, it's probably a little bit too high to see. But the branches that come off, the smaller branches, they actually crisscross. And you can actually use these, or they would have been used uh, in old days to as a fish hook because they're very strong and they point uh, sort of away from the branch. So then you can rope from, uh, lay, I think it was old lady's tongue, mother-in-law's tongue, that was it, mother-in-law's tongue. So it makes quite a strong fiber. So you make yourself some rope from that and then use the branch from a leadwood, and away you go, you can go fishing in the bush. Quite a young leadwood, that one. Quite a small, small trunk. It's probably about that sort of size. So they have seen some elephants uh, towards Mamba Road and Drakensberg Junction. So we're making our way down towards them. See if we can catch up with them before they head off into the bush. It sounds like they're moving at quite a small pace. The trouble is I keep getting sidetracked by other things, but there's no way you can drive past a kudu like that. Absolutely no way. <laughs> he is magnificent. And it's always nice to show you when we've been talking about different trees or animals or birds. If we haven't been able to see them, but then to be able to show you, it's always nice. Just to show you, to finish off the story, I like to do that. So I think we're going to carry on heading down towards where the elephants have been seen. And we're going to head back to Byron and see if he's found anything interesting for you as well. 
Well, that's great. I hope Tara gets to see those elephants and show them to you. Uh, it's very exciting. Now, I've decided I'm going to head back, all the way back up towards Sandy Patch. And that's basically directly west of where I am. So I'm going to head in that direction. A friend of mine that used to work um, work at Juma always used to say that was the, he used to love that area. It was his best area for finding leopards. So let's see if he's right. So I'm going to go around there, sit and listen and be patient. And maybe we find signs of these leopards. Uh, Simon, you know, I don't think... Uh, I, I don't think the time of year really uh, affects how easy it is to find leopards. I think both the summer and winter can be can be difficult. Uh, it's probably probably a bit easier in winter, I would say, Simon. Probably a bit easier. Their camouflage suits the winter conditions, though. I mean, the grass and that it's perfect to hide hide in the grass. It's nice and open, and maybe it's a bit easier to spot them moving through the area. Um, also, they most likely have to go to specific water holes, uh, because there isn't a lot of water around. But, summer, you know, summer I'd say is, is a slightly harder, because the bush is much thicker, and there's water everywhere for these animals. So. Simon, I would say I would say it's a bit easier in winter. You wouldn't say so because we haven't had any luck this morning, <laughs> but but I would say it's probably a bit easier in, in winter, slightly. Jake, a leopard saw, a uh, leopard sawing or, or leopard call, um, it's quite loud. I, I would say you can probably hear it from about, may, on a clear day, maybe two, three kilometers away from a big male, possibly. Um, it, de it, it does depend, but I, w I, would, I would guess about that. Um, look, it's not like a male lion call that can be heard sometimes from about 10 kilometers away on clear days. So um, they are loud, but not nearly as loud as obviously lions. But, um, but yeah, I don't say we've heard leopard calls from about two kilometers away before. Mason, you asked if leopards are at risk at being endangered. Um, Mason, no. Look, there are leopards everywhere. There are leopards everywhere. Um, they adapt very well to certain areas. Very elusive cats. And, um, and the population, leopard population, especially in southern Africa, is very, very good and very healthy at the moment. But, you know, we need to still... Um, focus on conservation protecting areas protecting the animals and um, but but the leopard population is very very good however if we if we don't protect the animals like anything that they, they, they could potentially face uh, face a threat Chitty Chitty Meg, you asked how many leopards are there in South Africa compared to cheetah? Yes. <laughs> I have no idea. I have no idea, Meg. I'm sorry. I don't know. I don't know the exact numbers, and I don't know how accurate they would be. There's by far, by far, more leopards. Um, but I don't know what the exact number would be. I, I couldn't even guess. 
but there, there are hundreds, hundreds of leopards. Cheetah, cheetah are rare. Cheetah are, in, are endangered. There are very, very few cheetah. Um, so that's easy. The, I, I don't know what the number is of cheetah in Kruger at the moment in the Greater Kruger area, but I wouldn't, I wouldn't say it's a lot at all. It's always difficult with the numbers because, you know, how accurate are they? I mean, they can kind of have an idea in an area, but a place like Kruger that is so big, it's very difficult to be accurate. Might be a bit easier with prides of lions uh, because the lion prides are very territorial and generally the guides, uh, guides or the um, researchers in those areas, they know more or less how many lions in, in the prides. However, saying that, I, I did a walk uh, in Kruger a few years ago and um, and I'd never walked in that area before but I, I led a walk and I had we had a guy that come with that knew the area well um, just to kind of give me an idea of you know where, what what is where where the drainage lines are where the water holes are that type of thing um, but uh, we walked into an area and there was a beautiful rocky outcrop and I thought let's go and have a look there um, and as we approached this outcrop, the, these the three little lion cubs came running out and came running towards us. I obviously got a big fright because I thought, well, where's the mother? Um, you do not want to get close to lion cubs, especially near a den. So I think she was using that as a den site. She'd hidden the cubs there. But Kruger Park is so big, no one knew they were there. No one knew that, those, that lioness had cubs, firstly. Um, and uh, and where they were so that was that was a really great surprise but it just shows you then it's easy to miss maybe a few lions here or there or especially cheetah or leopards now let's stop here for a second and try and listen again all right well let's head back across to the tea making Tara and find out if she's found more trees and grasses or if she's found some animals to show you. <laughs> I have actually, <laughs> I picked this up uh, along the way. So we're actually, we're, we're close to where we found the elephants. So I'll uh, tell you a little bit more about this, but it was actually Craig that inspired me to pick this up. Uh, going on about, uh, obviously we, we have the general store. If you have a toothache, this is really good. Now, I did ask Craig if he's actually tried it before, and he almost made the mistake of saying no. Because <laughs> I was gonna see if you want to try it on camera. Um, but yeah, so if you've got a toothache, if you take a leaf from the silver cluster leaf, and hopefully if we get a bit of sun, um, otherwise I might use the spotlight when we stop to show you why it's a silver cluster leaf. Because uh, it's actually got the silver hairs and you can actually see it. But uh, I'll need some sunlight, or as I say, some spotlight to help me with that so you can see it. But if you chew it, it's got a, a very high amount of tannins in the leaf. So it, it dries your mouth out, but it also helps to numb your mouth. So if you do have a toothache, it's a very good one to use. So apparently the elephants were last seen at the junction with Drakensberg, so we're almost there. So as I say, if we, um, if we stop, I'll try and show that to you as well. So see if we can find ourselves. So I think we're gonna try taking this little road here and that should, I believe, be leadwood. But it is a little bit etchy. Exactly which which road it is. But we'll try it anyway, because he said that they crossed over here. And I'm seeing the tracks just there as well, crossing over there. So it would be about right. Yeah, all tracks around here. Yep, 
He said it was a fairly big herd, so it'd be nice to see them. But believe it or not, elephants, the size of them, you'd expect that they make a lot of noise. And when they're upset, or when they are actually meaning to make noise, then they will create quite a lot of noise. They can be heard trumpeting, ah, oh, there they are, up to 10 kilometers away. But otherwise, moving through the bush, they are silent, and it's all to do with their foot. So the foot is packed full of tissue, and it moulds around rocks and branches and things like that. If uh, that's if they uh, they do walk over them, but quite often they avoid them. But because their foot moulds, it actually allows them to walk very, very softly. And they are like the ghosts of the bush. So I'm going to see if we can actually get in front of there's the herd here and see if we can work out where they're going to be walking so we can get in front and hopefully have them walk in front of us. So I'm going to go around. There's a nice open area here. It looks like they're heading towards. Byron's got his binoculars out. That sounds exciting. <laughs> so while we try and position ourselves, let's see what he's got. No, it's wishful thinking, I, I think. Um, but I can hear Franklin alarm calling in the grass or to the back behind those behind those impala. But there's a herd of impala straight ahead of me. Perhaps the uh, uh, Franklin are just having a little argument between each other. Well, Franklins aren't always the most reliable when it comes to alarm calls. And his impala seem completely relaxed. Just worth a look. It's amazing. I mean, I really, I really would have thought we would have some sign of these leopards, but I'm not going to give up. I'm still going to drive around and see how it sounds like Tara has managed to find those beautiful gray animals that I love so much. Oh, I have indeed <laughs> finally caught up with them. So we've got, it does look like the group's spread out quite a lot. So we have a youngster here chewing on what looks to be an umbrella thorn. being chivied up by mother. Now hopefully you can kind of hear where those feet were being placed and um, um, it might have been a little bit too far away to hear the, all you could hear was the crunch. But again, it was very, very soft. But otherwise, you couldn't really hear her moving through the bush. So the herd is dotted all over. And as I say, they, they're slowly moving sort of that way. But we've got a couple in front of us. There's a few just behind us here. So I'm just going to slightly reposition again so that we're out in the open. Because she was actually just stood in front of this tree here. So I didn't want to get too close to her and upset her. If we can actually pull forward. I think the rest of the herd are over there so if we follow where they went and we'll try and see if we can pull in around in front of them again. So I was hoping those that are over there behind the thick bush were going to come out this side. 
but they're all spaced out, they're all really relaxed, they're feeding and they're just taking their time. But as I said before, they, they don't need to have highly nutritious food. They can have very poor quality food and this time of year it's quite normal to see them digging roots up from the trees. Oh, and we've got a battalier overhead as well. Circling to see if there's anything worth diving down to investigate. You can see the rain clouds forming. Quite unusual for this time of year. It is very, very normal. I mean, you can see it's quite dry and that is very normal for this time of year in winter. It doesn't tend to rain, so that's why it's quite unusual to have these clouds forming this time of year. And it is still quite mild. This is what's really amazing me. So it's usually a lot colder during the day, or during the night at least, and first thing in the morning. I can see that the rest, they are kind of heading in that direction. So, again, oh, here we go. I was going to say, I wonder where that little family popped out. Uh, just here on the right. But I think, oh, okay. <laughs> I was just about to say, let's see what, uh, what Byron might have, but with them coming out. I think we're gonna stick with this little family group here. So the... Hi, Riti. And I'm wondering if you actually heard the elephant breaking the tree just behind. So again, just say, it looked like she was trying to push it over, but maybe she's uh, deciding actually she's just going to go for some of the branches instead. Yeah. And what they'll do is they'll quite often take a branch and they, they'll eat the bark, they'll strip the bark off the branch. So they'll sometimes, that looks like a, quite a small branch compared to what they would normally pick up. And they'll actually just walk with it almost like a, a chewing sweet and they'll twist it around in the mouth and just peel off the bark. Oh yeah, she knows she's going for it then. <laughs> but Riti wanting to know, oh, I'm hearing someone else bashing the way through the bush there. Uh, if a baby elephant is left by itself, could a predator attack it and kill it? And Riti, yes it could, but that's why baby elephants are never left on their own. And that is, one of the reasons why the elephants do have family groups so that everyone can actually look after the baby. So when the baby is extremely small, everyone is very, very protective uh, of that baby. So sisters and aunts, and they just make sure that that baby can try and make it through to adulthood. What was really interesting is they actually did an experiment up in Chobe. Uh, they had uh, a pride of lions that would call now in Chobe the, the lions there they actually have prides up to about 30 strong and they've learnt to hunt elephant and the elephants uh, if they've actually had the experience of being hunted they found oh there's an elephant that's sneaking up behind us here <laughs> I told you they are so quiet he's just behind the bush he's gonna pop out Hello. <laughs> oh, and here comes Mum. Hello, lady. Bow, 
special is this? I'm keeping quiet so you can actually hear how quiet they are. I say they really did sneak up on us. <laughs> I thought they were going around the back, but decided to go around the front. Absolutely beautiful. So we're going to try and see if we can catch up with them again. I think that's everybody. So yeah, as I said, they um, they actually had the uh, the call of the lions playing, and they found that the females who had been attacked by lions in the past, they would immediately surround the calves uh, into, into a little circle with the ladies. Oh, I just heard the grumbling then. So with all the, the ladies looking out, making sure they could detect where the threat might come from. And the elephants that hadn't had that experience didn't react in the same way. They, they still, they would still keep close to the, the youngsters, but they, didn't surround them like the other females did. Really interesting. Really interesting. So that deep rumble is coming from the female on the right of your screen now. And quite often that deep rumble is, come on everybody, let's get moving. But you can see there the uh, moving using the foot to dig up the root or to try and dig up the plant. Now, that plant is not looking particularly <laughs> appealing to me, but it does look like it could be... Actually, I just have a smell of it. No, it's not what I thought it was, actually. Sorry, I'm just trying to see if I can smell it. It's only the Latin names spring into mind. It's, it reminds me of Olipia Javanica. I'll try and remember the original name, or the common name. But I thought that's what it might be, but it's not looking quite right, and it's not smelling quite right, so it's not. But uh, if anyone out there does does know what it might be. I'll see if I can do a bit of digging. But uh, as I say, apparently this little chap likes it. Hi Andy. Welcome on board this morning. I'm wondering if a lion does kill a baby are they likely, the females, are they likely to band together and kill the lion? Well, they certainly will not be happy and there will be a lot of commotion and certainly trying to chase off the lion. But again, it depends, it really will depend on the circumstances. I mean, if there's a lot of lions around, chances are they're not going to be successful. And again, it's, it's all to do with numbers game. It really is. So even if you're the largest land mammal in the world, if there's 30 lions, you're not gonna win that battle. Unless there's very, very special circumstances. If the individual is particularly aggressive and, are, and uh, quite bold, you might get the lions being so shocked that actually they might just leave their kill. <laughs> but they really are just absolutely amazing animals. I mean, just the power that they possess. I mean, they could just come and flip this vehicle over if they wanted to, but you can see that's not what elephants are about. You know, generally speaking, they are very, very chilled. And you quite often see 
if they're not sure about something they'll lift the trunk and if you look carefully the eyes are very small compared to the size of the head I mean look how tiny those eyes it's like they're, they're seeing just a blur of what we are they'll be able to see us but they say very little detail so they have the oversized ears obviously to help keep them cool but that also helps them to hear they're just like picking any information up and then obviously they have the trunk and the trunk or the sense of smell is incredibly good it's even better than that of a dog's so they'll quite often lift the trunk into facing into the wind and seeing if they can get any information about predators or anything unusual around Hi Jason. Jason asking if it's painful for elephant to grow their tusks. I would say it's just like a human because their tusks, they're the front teeth. Uh, so they're the incisors. And the babies do actually have milk tusks. And I wonder, you know, when, when we're children it can be quite painful when the, the, the milk teeth are first breaking through. And I, I reckon it's got to be the same for a baby elephant. But if you think the when we lose our milk teeth, it's not really that painful unless you get a tooth that's a little bit awkward. But uh, otherwise, it's you know because it's already the gum's already been broken through, and it's the, that pathway's been established. It's not really that painful. So I'd, I'd say probably when the tusks are first formed, I think that could be. But then you don't really see the baby. Um, being in pain if you like you know you don't really hear them squealing I mean obviously with babies they cry so I don't know really interesting one but I think once once the milk teeth have been established if there is any pain the actual tusks won't be so we've just lost sight of them so we're going to see if we can maybe catch up but it looks like the thick bush is going to be upon us so we'll see how lucky we are so in the meantime let's cross over to Byron and see if he's got anything for you I've got nothing Tara I've got absolutely nothing <laughs> I'm looking at no sign of those leopards anywhere I am um, I'm starting to think maybe it's time to give up a little bit on them for now. We can maybe try again later, but I'm, I feel like I need to find something. So I'm, go, I'm taking a different route. Going to go have a look down in the south a little bit um, and see maybe we have some luck down there. Not much going on in that area that we were in. It's quite cold now. The temperature's definitely dropped. Senza, you warm enough? <laughs> Natalie, you asked if I have a favorite bird. I do indeed. I think my favorite bird is a Marshall Eagle. I um, just love the Marshall Eagles. But, but I must be honest, um, there are few that I really enjoy for different reasons. So the Marshall Eagle, big, powerful, eagle very beautiful uh, regal and just it's got a serious it's got a seriousness to it i think that's the best way i can describe it it's got this these deep set eyes it looks like these piercing eyes just love a martial eagle um the others would be um some of the little the little shagras that dart in amongst the trees just because they've got beautiful calls um oh wow look at the look at the kudu bull look at the kudu bull over there there we go that's lovely. Beautiful big kudu ball. Look at that. Look at those horns. There's two. There's one through the back there. Uh, Mita, good morning, young Mita. Um, I hope you are having a wonderful evening or start to the day. Um, now, Mita, you asked, is the kudu as tall as a moose? Now, 
I think they're very close meter in, in height, but I think I think a moose is actually a bit taller uh, meter. I know moose get quite big, and I think a moose is a bit taller than a kudu. However, a kudu is is tall. It is a big antelope. Oh, look at that. That's a lovely male. That's a very beautiful male. Oh, he's got serious horns. You can see those white tips. It's also a sign of age. You see that other one through the back there. But these horns aren't as, nearly as big as this one. tend to break apart during the summer so they're going to be distantly related so you'll get the uh, in the in the you see like the unit if you like so it's just through the bushes there you've got the unit of probably mother grandmother uh, maybe a daughter and you know their offspring and then you have maybe the aunt is going to be another small family group somewhere but they're all going to be females with the offspring and then as the youngsters get older the females will either stay with the mother or they might break away and uh, have their own family unit as they get older but then you get the young males when they reach about 16 18 and it's amazing how many similarities there are between elephants and humans when you get to 16 or 18 they tend to start lagging behind and they start getting a bit boisterous and they just have a bit more distance between each other uh, their, well them and their family and eventually they they go wandering off and they find the company of other larger males and they that's when they actually learn how to be a, a man and uh, or a bull but during the family years they learn the basics where to find food where to find water, where to find nutrients, how to look after themselves, which is obviously very important as well. So it really always is amazing to me how similar elephants are to humans. Hi Jenny, welcome on board this morning. Do I ever feel in danger? Um, it's all about reading the animals and some animals sometimes have bad days just like humans and obviously they can't talk they can't say hey you know what I'm really not in the mood today so you have to understand what they're trying to tell you using their body language and occasionally you could you can get it wrong if you're not listening correctly occasionally uh, elephants can be having a bad day but look like they're actually okay and then all of a sudden they just decide they're going to snap and change so you also you're looking for those warnings that that's what's going to happen. But very, very rarely have I ever felt endangered. I can count on one hand. Um, one of them was actually from a captive animal. It was actually a giraffe. And that was, I, I really felt threatened that day. And there was just something in his posture and in his eye, I cannot explain, but that something was different. And I just felt, you know what, he means business and I managed to get out of the enclosure just as he kicked out and apparently his hoof was a few centimeters from my head. I don't know what I had done to upset him, but something that day, he was not happy. And as I say, luckily I read the situation and I got out of there. I have never felt threatened in the bush. There was 
I've been charged by a female elephant, and again, I think there was a predator around, so they were all sort of on tenter hooks anyway, and we'd stopped a good 80, 90 meters from them. And she decided she was going to charge towards us. And it was, it was halfway between a warning charge and a full charge, but I think because there was a lot of trees in the way, um, it, it diluted the charge, let us say. But I think also it was displacement behavior. So when they're agitated, and what they're actually agitated at is not there to take it out on, they will then shift their focus to something, and, and that was what happened. And something said to me, you know what, don't stand and shout. Just say something. So I just, as soon as she got about 10, 10 meters or so, she was slowing down, I could see she's slowing down, so I just said to her, hey lady, what's this? And it almost broke that trance or something, and she just she, she just stopped dead. And then she realized, oh, okay, we're, we're not a threat, we're not, we're not to worry about, and she moved on. But uh, that was pretty intense. Just gonna try and reposition. <laughs> Just see them through there. Is that good for you through there? They're slowly making their way. We're going to get them popping out the bush just now, I think. Slowly making their way. There we go. Hi, Riti. Uh, I'm wondering if that's the most thrilling experience I've had on Wild Earth. And that was one of them, certainly. <laughs> I think uh, having the big male Majingilans walk down the side of the vehicle uh, literally, I could have put my hand out and touched them, all four of them, was quite breathtaking and my heart was in my mouth. And I think actually the last male lion looked at me, he looked directly at me and I thought, uh oh, game over, <laughs> for a split second. And then he just looked away and moved on, but uh, that was that was quite incredible as well. And of course, you are or you are going to have the longer you spend in the bush, the more chance you have of having these type of encounters. I mean, obviously, you try and limit them. Um, and the lions was was done on purpose because we we pulled off the road and they were going to walk down the side of the vehicle. Uh, and as I say, you know, we're we're not food to them. They've got plenty of food out in the bush. So there's not really any reason as long as they fit and healthy. Uh, for them to actually attack and again you do get warnings and they were just calmly walking down the side of the vehicle or down the road so uh, quite often as a guide you give your guests that experience as well so you park off the side of the road and just let them walk by and it really is something you cannot describe unless you've actually had that experience of such a powerful animal being that close to you and it's the same with the elephants as well and uh, you know they, they have this ability to be able to tip over the vehicle if they wanted to but as we're showing here they're quite happy chilling and enjoying their breakfast now i wonder if anyone has actually got back to us about the horns of the kudu it'd be nice to actually uh, get an update on that I'm hearing the female at the back grumbling. Okay, so we're still waiting to hear if anyone can find... Oh, we've got some babies coming through. Oh, look at that. <laughs> oh. But thanks, Maggie. Maggie having a look for us. Couldn't find anything about the weight of the horn. So uh, that one's still open. Hashtag Safari Live. If anyone can look up the weight of kudu horns, because unfortunately that one has slipped my me memory. But here we come. We've got the family coming through now. There's a few babies that might pop out onto the road.
front and they wear the last set can wear down so they they wear down at roughly the same pace the females and the males so if, if disease doesn't get to them the starvation eventually and that can happen around 60 70 years of age so i think byron's got something for you so we're going to say goodbye to you for now and see what he has now i have got something interesting everybody so my plan of just moving out of the area and having a look around elsewhere has paid off. I want to show you quickly. Have a look at this. Now, we had a quick look, but have a look here. Now, Senzo, can you see this track over there? There we go. That's a male leopard track right here. Now, there's one track. Look here, here's another track. Looks like a female. This is possibly the mating pair, everyone. Just judging, looking at the tracks here, it looks like there are two leopards walking along the road here, because one track is slightly off to the right, and then one track off to the left. Uh, and we're quite far from where they were last night. So we're all the way down at that prominent torchwood, that Balanites. So they turned and they decided to come south, but they've walked along here. These tracks look fresh, they look like from maybe early, early this morning, um, which is good. So we, at least we're heading in the right direction. Oh, they go all the way along down here. I've been sitting listening, I haven't heard anything, but I also don't know how far they've traveled. Don't know how far they've traveled. They could have gone um, a little further, but at least, at least we have clear tracks of them now. That's exciting. So let's see. I'm going to try my best to track these leopards. It's not always easy, especially if they head off road through the thickets. I'm just having a look here. Now, James, um, sorry, I'm just trying to understand your question quickly. I, did, did, um, I couldn't quite grasp what Chantal was saying there. Um, something about... Yeah. <sighs> Sorry, I'm just listening to Chantal again. No, so James, you you asking about a leopard that a leopards that mate, for example, a female leopard. You're saying if a female leopard may mate with a, a male that they feel is less dominant, um, that they make themselves less fertile. I don't know about that. That doesn't make sense to me, and I'll tell you why. Is when females mate, they won't go and mate with a male that isn't dominant or that, that is less dominant. The, the, uh, it's unlikely. It's unlikely. They will go and mate with a male that they feel is possibly dominant.
that bull, if if there's another bull that's in must around, I don't think he's going to get a look in. Even though he was quite a large bull, but he seemed to be on a mission, so somebody must have said something that he's picked up on. So they've headed into the bush. We're going to carry on and. Actually, while it's still in my head, let me see if I can... I was hoping the sun might come out. But maybe I can actually shine up... Oh, it's not really shining silver, is it? No, it's not really coming up, unfortunately. I can... Sl maybe if I turn it that way, we might be able to catch a silver, a silvery sheen there but not so much. Which makes me think perhaps it is actually, oh no, the, the silver hairs are there. I was thinking maybe it was um, a, gold, a green cluster leaf, but it's actually not, it is still silver. I can see the small silvery hairs, but uh, apparently I didn't pick, enough, pick a good enough sample, sadly. But silver cluster leaf for uh, chewing and uh, helping with a toothache. I'll see if I can find one with better better silver hair so it shines up. So apparently you guys have been uh, finding some leopard tracks. So when we're not writing the leopards off just yet. I'm going to head down towards Treehouse Dam, see if there's anything around there. Uh, leaving the elephants to carry on south. Unless they pop out onto Gary Main, then we might have another look to see if that bull's cut, cut up with the female that might be an estrus, because that would be really exciting to see elephant mating because uh, they will mate with bulls that aren't in must if there's no other males around and the female will allow the male to follow her and she'll she'll kind of pull him away from the herd um, it's probably likely to make sure that the calves are nice and safe and she'll kind of wander off and he'll follow and I think we have caught it once on Safari Live uh, quite a while back of a uh, an elephant mating. I've never seen it personally. But that would be quite spectacular to see. Hello, Impala. So I'm wondering if anyone has come back with the weight of kudu horns, otherwise I might have to do some research later on. No, nope, no one's come back. Okay. I shall have to do a bit of research and see where I've written it down. Unless Byron can remember, maybe Byron knows. I'm just trying to think. I can't even think of what region it was in. So the elephant tusk can weigh up to 100 kilos for a big bull elephant, e each tusk, which is about the same size as a baby elephant. So a baby elephant on either side, but I'd say that's for the big bulls. But the horns on the kudu, I don't know, maybe around I'd guess maybe about 30 kilos for the pair, maybe. Otherwise, yeah, I shall do some research and hopefully let you know on afternoon drive unless somebody comes back to us. Chitty Chatty Meg, welcome on board this morning. Good to hear from you again. I'm wondering if kudus are aggressive like buffalo not usually um, again when it's around the breeding season kudus could become a bit more aggressive and again if they've been sparring uh, they can have that displacement behavior like I was talking about they might thrash the bush just to get a bit of frustration out but generally speaking, they're pretty chill. They're, they're nice and laid back. A lovely, lovely antelope. Quite magnificent. Oh, 
so I do wonder how Byron's getting on with the tracks. So I think we're gonna see how he is getting on. Oh, giraffe. Hello, beautiful boy. Just goes to show, you don't know what's gonna happen when it's live. <laughs> Wasn't expecting to find him there. So I think I'm gonna reposition, see if we can get a nicer view of him. So in the meantime, if you want to catch up with Byron and see how he is getting on with his tracks, um, we'll come back to you hopefully with a better view of this bull giraffe. Um, so I haven't seen any more tracks. Done a big loop around this area. I'm heading back in the direction where those tracks were now. But I'm just stopping, I'm listening again. I'm hoping that I pick up some sound of these animals. These two leopards. It's very difficult at times, but but often listening out it, it helps so much. Now you see the thing is they didn't carry on walking down the road, they cut off and they from what I saw it looked like they headed in this direction. Um, I may just go back and double check those tracks again and just try to see exactly which direction they, they m left the road but it did appear as if it was this direction. Maybe I think I'm going to give it another two minutes. I'm going to sit here very quietly. I'm just going to listen and see if I can't hear anything. Let's head back to Tara, who's got that.
beautiful giraffe for you. Well, as promised, we've managed to get into a slightly better position to see this beautiful bull. And he's listening to something. Now, they might not talk a lot, but if you listen, they do say a lot with their body and their ears. Now, if you think at how tall a giraffe can get, I have heard of males getting up to six, six meters tall, but that's not the norm. Generally speaking, males will get maybe four four and a half meters. But they've obviously got their eyes right up on top of the head so they can see much further than most animals in the bush. So they usually are pretty quick to spot things. Yes, I'm talking about you. I hope you like what I'm saying. You've got beautiful eyes. So they can see for pre pretty far, so it's very difficult to actually creep up on a, on a giraffe. And especially if they've got their ears looking forward, which is an alert position, that means that they have seen something. And especially if a giraffe is alert, they're, even though most things can't harm them, they will still be alert for lion, especially. I have seen them being alert for a leopard with it being a large cat and occasionally you do hear of leopard taking out especially young giraffe an adult giraffe is going to be quite difficult for them so if you're able to find a giraffe and look if they are showing that alert position see where they're looking quite often they're spot on that there is something there that's why I always listen to a giraffe. Now the white, you might think, why do they have white ears? If you look at the rest of the body, it's dark. Especially with this bull, they do get darker with age. Generally speaking, males get darker than females. But you can see there's the light brown or beige in between. So why would they have white ears? Maybe have a think about that. And the ears are quite small compared to those of elephants and other animals. But why might they have white ears? Hashtag Safari Live if you think you know the answer. Now, that long neck can cause issues for a giraffe. Obviously, it's about, it can be about two meters in length. So it's really far from the heart. It's two meters above the heart. So that's gonna be pretty difficult to get the blood from the heart up to the top of the head. It's got to be under a lot of pressure. But the problem comes in, even though they've gotten over that problem of having the pressure, I think someone actually did give us the pressure, I think it was like 240 over 80. And I keep meaning to check out what it is for a human, but it's obviously nowhere near that much. So they've got extremely high blood pressure, so they can pump the blood up there. The heart's about 12 kilos in weight, so they've got one of the largest hearts to body ratio of, the ma of all the mammals. And as I say, rightly so, because they've got to pump that blood up there. The big problem comes in when they put their head below the heart, so when they actually need to drink. So the giraffe actually has a lot of adaptations to basically stop its head from exploding when it puts its head down. So in the archery, the uh, blood vessel that actually takes blood from the heart to the head, and other animals it doesn't have any valves it's just the veins that have valves and the veins help to stop blood flowing back on itself but in the giraffe 
these valves are found in the artery, so it actually stops the blood going too quickly to the head. Oh, hello, beautiful. <laughs> You're showing us, showing us your best side. They also have a sponge-like network of blood vessels at the base of their brain as well. And it's called a wonderful nettle, Rete Marabire, mi, sorry, it's tripping over my tongue there, Rete Marabile. So it's it, the tiny blood vessels, the capillaries, and they actually act like a sponge. So the artery is already slowing the blood down, but by the time the blood reaches the brain, this net of blood vessels can actually soak up blood as well. And because it's going into the small, small blood vessels, it's slowing it down again. So it really is, there's a lot of adaptations there to help the giraffe. And without it, as I say, as soon as it put its head down, it would die. So I think we've got some answers for why the giraffe has white ears. So it'd be interesting to see what you guys come back with. Roxy, yes indeed, giraffes communicate with their ears. Well done, Roxy bragging rights to you today as well. Very impressed. So, like we're saying, the eyes right up there on the top of the head, the ears not far behind, but as I say, the ears are going to be on the same level. So the other giraffe, if they're in a small herd, can actually see each other over the tops of the trees and in amongst all the branches. So they can actually keep an eye on where each other is. And the white just stands out like a sore thumb. Now, unfortunately, we're in, not in the right position that the sun is just behind the giraffe, so it's not shining up that white. But if you're behind, uh, and the sun especially is shining them up, you can really see those white ears jump out at you. And sometimes that's the first thing that you see on the giraffe is those white ears. Michelle, welcome on board this morning. Michelle asking, do giraffes sleep standing up? They can, but they also they don't sleep for long periods of time. If they go into a deep sleep, they can sit down, but as we said, they, they can't keep put the head down uh, for very long periods of time. Uh, again, they would have the problem that the sponge would stop working. Uh, so again, they can't put the heads down for long periods of time. So they can sit down with their heads sticking up. And they can sleep maybe five or six times during the day or night. And if they go into a deep sleep, it can be, you know, 10, 12 minutes at a time. And that'll be when they're in a deep sleep. And if they go into a very deep sleep, they will sometimes rest their head on the back. So they kind of curl it around and rest it there. So that's when you know a giraffe is really in a deep sleep. As I say, they don't, they, they take short, intense naps. Now he's looking again at something moving. So I'm going to stick with this giraffe and see if he's actually spotted something of interest. But apparently Byron has had some luck with some warthogs. Oh, I have indeed. So maybe this is a sign that our luck is changing a little bit this morning. Some warthogs, but even these warthogs, you can see one or two running through the back. They disappear so well in this long grass at the moment. The dry grass, anyway. I've been listen listening very, very carefully. I haven't heard any sounds that sound like mating leopards. Looks like a lot of warthog through there. I can't see exactly, but it looked like at least six or seven warthogs walking through there. But you can see it's very difficult to see. I think there's more actually. That would be a wonderful meal for a leopard. I do enjoy warthogs, not always easy to catch them. And some <laughs> Look, you see, look how well camouflaged they are. I think let's carry on with our leopard search. I'm hoping, I don't know, maybe we still have luck. There's um, 
And there's, we've got about half an hour or so left, or 40 minutes left. Maybe that's enough time to find some mating leopards. I will be so happy if that does happen. Um, but it just shows you driving around. You've got to be, you've got to be aware and alert, and and not give up if you are tracking something. But it is difficult being or tracking alone. It helps if there's another vehicle that uh, that can help or um, you can check different areas, listen different times. It can make it a lot easier then. Anyway. Let's see what we can find. I'll try my best, I promise. Let's head back to Tara and see how it's going. If she's still with that giraffe or what she's found now, she's having a lucky morning. Haha, I am indeed. But hopefully there might be some luck at the end. So it's never over until the camera is stopped rolling. <laughs> so I'm still holding thumbs for you. See if we have any luck with those leopard tracks. So the, the um, there was a, another vehicle that uh, came through. That's why we've just had to move. So we're blocking the road. So whatever had uh, caught his attention, it's obviously not enough to hold it. So I don't think there's a predator there. But there I think there was something moving through the undergrowth, but I couldn't see what it was. But as I say, he didn't seem to be too phased by it. Now a giraffe can actually defend itself with the long legs. They can give quite a nasty kick and they are able to kick and defend themselves from a lion or any other, well, it really would be a lion that would go for them. There's not really anything else uh, that size giraffe uh, that would actually attack. And interestingly enough, in especially in the Kruger where there's the tar roads, they've actually found that many of the giraffe hunts actually happen on something like 1% of Kruger and that tends to be the tarmac roads, especially when it's raining. So lions have been known to chase the giraffes onto the tar roads and when they're wet then uh, it'll slip and fall and that's when the lions can actually come in. Now you can see really nicely now what I was saying earlier if the sun's shining on those ears, those white ears just shining up Absolutely beautiful. <laughs> He's still listening to us. <laughs> so you can really see how well that's going to work with other giraffe. Now it is normal to find a bull by himself and you can get a group of giraffes and it's quite a loose society so it's not with the kudu they'll tend to stay together uh, with the elephants and say they're small family units they'll stay together but with giraffes, it depends on what they feel like on the day. They might decide, you know what, I'm gonna stay with my friend, the other female, for a few days, and then she'll wander off, maybe need a bit of alone time. I think the most I've ever seen has been about 15 giraffes. So I think we're gonna leave him. Chit. Was it chit or kid? Chit. Kid. Kid was wondering if giraffes were, on, were, were usually solitary. So hopefully that's answered your question, Kit. See? <laughs> Picked up <or> telepathically. <laughs> so we're all at Twin Dams so we're gonna have a look around there and we're gonna go through the Milwati which was where uh, Byron had the leopard a couple of days ago so the riverbeds are usually quite a good area to check although this time of day you might find the leopards sunning themselves on a termite mound but last night wasn't too cold, but the wind is picking up and it, I do wonder if it is going to bring rain. So it has been quite blustery. <laughs> Anna Marie. <laughs> 
have I had a surprise encounter with a leopard that actually scared me. <laughs> I have. <laughs> Although I think maybe both of us were scared at the same time. <laughs> so I went out. Uh, I went out to go and check the vehicle uh, just before drive. And in those days, we only had the one vehicle going out. We didn't have the two. So I went out and it was dark as it usually is before uh, the setup. And as I came out of my room, it was just that, that vague light. So I could, it would have been enough just to see some movement. And I actually did see some movement, something about 10 meters, 50 meters, just up the little road behind uh, the little lump in the road something crouched and just and as I say I'd literally just woken up just got myself sorted five ten minutes walked out so I'm still half asleep so I kind of took a second look and I tried to squinted and realized that actually it was a leopard <laughs> and by that point there was just enough light that I could actually see um, that the, a few spots so I could actually work out that it was a leopard and I, what you, you're not supposed to run, you're supposed to stand your ground. But as I say, half asleep in the morning, and I'm right next to the vehicles in the garage. And I went, ah, leopard, and the leopard went, ah, human. <laughs> so I dived into the uh, garage and the leopard shot off. And I did find uh, the tracks later, and it turned out that they were the size of Karula. It was right in the middle of her territory or core area so I'm pretty sure Karula paid me a visit that morning <laughs> as I say half asleep uh, you don't always follow the rules of the bush <laughs> but yeah luckily the garage was there so I could just dive in but that was probably the the one that uh, sticks out the most Uh, so we're at Treehouse Dam, seeing if there's any movement around, seeing if there's anyone lying on the banks. Now this changed after the cyclone hit. This changed. So this has now opened up completely a big sandbank, whereas before it wasn't that wide. So that was one of the biggest change, changes after the cyclone in January 2012. So I think we're going to carry on looking around this area, see if we can find you anything of interest. And in the meantime, I think Byron's got something to show you. No, nothing yet, but um, I just went back to where I had those tr last tracks just to double check I didn't miss anything. They've definitely headed into this block. Now, we did a loop right around. I didn't see any tracks coming out on the other side, but oh, I wonder, I mean, oh, it's so difficult. They could very easily be in here somewhere. Oh, that is frustrating. If we just had a sound, any little sign or hint of exactly where they are, Oh well, let's, what I'm going to do, so I'm going to drive around, I'm going to check the boundary roads to see if they've crossed out of the boundary. If, they, if we don't have any tracks around there, then we know they have to be in this area somewhere. And even if we don't have luck this morning, maybe this afternoon they head, come out somewhere and we can have a look around here. Keep your eyes peeled, Senzo. Maybe we spot a leopard moving around. See, it is still very cool. So chances are they could easily be, still be moving around. 